Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have John Cameron, author of Rekill, Rewire, and Aristocracy, coming out uh, next spring. spring. Okay, yes. welcome to the show. Also, Timothy Snowball, who is a, uh, an attorney at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Thank you for being a part of the show. The, there's been a, an avalanche, a veritable, uh, you know, snowball, if I will, of uh, sexual misconduct coming. I've heard that one before, right? Coming, <laughs> coming, coming down the slopes, both in the private sector and in the public sector. We have uh, sexual misconduct in the private sector. We've got Harvey Weinstein, the head of a, of a big film production company. Roger Ailes, the, the CEO of Fox News. Bill O'Reilly had a, you know, a popular show on Fox News. Matt Lauer of uh, Morning Show, uh, NBC and a whole bunch of other guys in the private sector, all of them got canned, right? Or uh, resigned. Mm -hmm. Resigned, uh, or quit, or wife fired. left them, lost their contracts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and then you had a bunch of people in the public sector, of course, starting out with Bill Clinton mm -hmm. and uh, c c continuing with Roy Moore, continuing with uh, Al Franken, continuing with, uh, with uh, uh, John Conyers and a number of others. Uh, and up until the last couple of days, for the last couple of weeks, the politicians, they stayed in office, untouchable. What's up with that? Well, uh, what's up with that is, is that uh, politicians are elected officials who should be held to a higher standard than um, people in the private sector uh, are held to a much lower standard. And uh, we've, we've seen that uh, sociopaths, when caught being sociopaths in the private sector, are held accountable. Whereas sociopaths being caught being sociopaths in the public sector are given a free ride, and I think it's it's a uh, yet another um, piece of evidence that that power corrupts and, and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and that um, the best thing to do is limit the power of those people that we've we've given this basically free ride to, and and I think we should hold them to. A higher standard. Well, I think I think there's a, a public choice, uh, you know, <laughs> argument going on here. I think you've got a situation where, if you're in the private sector, you're uh, trying to, you know, if you're in business, you have to appeal to essentially the entire market. Mm -hmm. So NBC is trying to appeal to everybody. They want everybody to watch NBC instead of CBS or ABC. So Matt Lauer, uh, he can't afford, or NBC can't afford to have. Uh, a, 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 I think it was ABC, wasn't it? Good, whatever. Was it Good Morning America? I think it's a day show on NBC. Uh, today? Uh, yeah, whatever. I get them all confused. One of them. Yeah. One of those, one of those uh, legacy shows, <laughs> legacy networks. Uh, anyway, they're, they're still trying to, you know, have a, a widespread, you know, going after the entire market. So they're going after 100% of the people. Mm. As the long as the IQ of the people watching is below 100 The politicians, on the <laughs> other hand, are essentially going after the most of one of the tribes. Right. So, 40 to 60 percent of voters turn out in, in, in elections, depending on whether it's a, you know, a presidential election or, a, or a, an off-year election. 40 to 60 percent. The, on the Democratic side, that means that if you can win the primary with 20 to 30 percent of the electorate. Of the total district. Right? Of, the, of the total population, 20, 30 percent. And 20, 30 percent is probably going to get you elected in the general election. Mm -hmm. Because you don't, have to, you don't have to appeal to the people who aren't voting. Mm -hmm. They're, you, know, you, you ignore them. And you don't. All you have to do is get enough votes of your tribe in order to win. And that only takes 20, 30 percent. And there's also issues of, of contract when it comes to someone like Matt Lauer or any of these other um, celebrities. They probably have their production companies, where they very well could be in breach of contract for some kind of moral trespass like this. And that kind of contract does not exist when it comes to public office, except unless you subscribe to some theory of social contract or something like that. But I think the really interesting thing when you look at it from a political science perspective is the 20% you're talking about in the district. They may not necessarily like this behavior. They might find it reprehensible, but are there issues within their purview that they find to be more important? Does it matter more to them that this seat is retained by a Democrat or a Republican? Are they willing to forego and overlook this moral trespass? And these are disgusting disgusting acts, right? Anybody who, um, you know, gets implicated in something like this, at the very least, should be investigated. Um, now, whether or not, you know, uh, being accused of something like this is the same thing as having committed the act, whether that's proved it's into a whole due process argument, but I think at the very least, when you have someone like Al Franken, who it took, I think, eight different individuals coming forward and accusing him of this behavior, 
before suddenly uh, the Democrats were up in arms and, and discussed it with him and you know demanded his resignation. I think that happened today. Yeah, seven was okay. Eight, 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 yeah, eight, 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 eight crossed eight. the line. And John Conyers has been known to be a, a sexual predator for he's the dean of the Senate. I mean, or the, of, of the House. He's been a, a congressman longer than anybody else, and been known by the press corps, been known by the uh, aides on Capitol Hill. Don't get in an elevator with John Conyers Is that if right? you're a woman. Yeah, he's been he's well known, you know, within you know, in, in the whisper. What is he about 150 years old or what? <laughs> oh, in 80s, yeah, older than me, yeah. <laughs> Which say you know, saying hard something. Hard and uh, anyway, he no, I mean the guy. Well known to you, sort of like Bill what, Clinton in what, that respect. What, what bothers me, whether it's in the, the private sector or the public sector, is is the bully, is the abuse of power. Well, the other thing and about I I'm on my I'm, I'm on bully bully pulpit here for a minute. Um, when you take advantage of of power to force people, in essence, quid pro quo, mm -hmm. um, to perform an act uh, or to not protest against something that they're protesting against, <coughs> that's abhorrent. And I don't care whether it's um, in the private sector or the public sector. When people do that, they, they should be punished. If they have actually done it, they, they should be removed from a position of power so that they can no longer do it. And, right. it, and I don't care whether it's, um, whether it's public sector or private sector. And, and I, I'm glad to see you know, the, the Me Too thing um, it, it's about time that people are held accountable for, for acts that are basically an, an act that if a schoolyard bully did it, they, they would get grabbed by the ear and, and dragged to the principal's office. We need to drag more of these people to the principal's office. Well, yeah, I mean, if you take a look at, you know, back to the whole public choice thing, you've got people who are probably <clears throat> going to elect Roy Moore, mm -hmm. uh, accused of being a child molester in essence, mm -hmm. or certainly a dating, you know, in his 30s, dating 14-year-olds, that's, you know, that's mm -hmm. questionable by anybody's standards, I think. Except uh, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, well, maybe. And perhaps half of the planet ha half, half that of, don't have right. the idea but of the point or is, the age But the point is that he's probably going to get elected anyway. And if he does, what that tells you is that Republicans are more concerned about retaining a Republican vote in the Senate than they are about putting a sexual predator in office. And that's that 20 percent or 30 percent. It's a special election. Well, probably it, only about it's 20. not just the Republicans because the, the Democrats are up in arms <coughs> about this behavior yeah, among Democrats, Democrats the Democrats now and saying uh, they're rewriting history as Democrats are famous to do, saying we shouldn't have been supportive of, of Bill Clinton. But they Duh. were, they were for his, the eight years of his administration yeah. and right up through uh, Hillary's run. Only after Hillary lost are they jumping off Bill Clinton's bandwagon. And it's even more disturbing, I think, for a lot of these individuals who are already, like John was saying, in positions of power. You know what I mean? Um, from reports that I had read, Matt Lauer had been a chronic, you know, cheater on, on, on his spouse, right? Uh, the idea that some of these acts that they performed are, are so disgusting, right? That, that it's almost... Uh, you would have to be kind of a sociopath, right? But let me let me ask you, gentlemen, this though, because this comes up a lot of in the context of um, campus accusations uh, of rape, and this is in the news sometimes recently. And there's different um, uh, positions on this. Should there be a difference between an accusation and someone being subjected to due process? A lot of times, um, universities are catching a lot of flack. There's a lot of pushback recently. Universities have instituted rules, especially under the Obama administration, at the end of the Obama administration, where um, it was enough for an individual to come out and to make an accusation. And then there was a minimal, not even, uh, no due process or a minimal due process um, given to the person who was being accused. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's accused. So I mean, I'm not, Fre I'm, you know, French no, I'm not, I'm not uh, promoting the idea that the accusation creates the crime if people are, are guilty are guilty of abuse of power and these people are self admittedly guilty of an abuse of power then they should be dismissed from their office public or private but um, everyone in this country deserves due process we I, I'm a big fan of our constitution and right in there it says that you are yeah, innocent so until, until proven, until guilty, proven yeah. guilty and being being accused of a crime should not be, like Jay accused. Yeah, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that properly. Um, 
you know, uh, putting somebody under the guillotine because somebody yells out from the crowd is is what that feels like. And and I disagree with the idea that the accusation creates the crime. Evidence creates the crime. Or in this case, all of these people have admitted to, you know, the crime of abuse of power, forcing people into sexual acts to either uh, keep a job or acquire favor or get promotion or whatever it is. So um, I think in their case, it's fine, but if, if someone, uh, I think Roy Moore at this point in time is still denying that he's done all these things or not? Yeah, sort of. Sort of, sort of, sort of semi-denying? Sort of, yeah, yeah. Sort of, yeah. I, um, again, innocent until proven guilty. Um, you know, if if a hundred people come forward and say you're guilty, does that make you guilty? Well, no. how many? Half a dozen or more have, have yeah. accused Trump of, of, uh, of this, you know, inappropriate appropriate behavior. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> the, the the question is what you know. I mean, the, the, I think the the uh, the, uh, the takeaway is that there should be more transparency. We've got you know the ethics investigations in Congress, mm -hmm. where if they're found guilty of doing something, taxpayers pay pay <laughs> off the victim as opposed to the. Well, in Conyers' case, they, they they use public money to pay off. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. And and now Con now Conyers finally resigned under pressure from the Democrats because I think they want to establish. The precedent that they're you know squeaky clean now that uh, Roy Moore is probably going to get elected that's that's my guess you know it's a political thing, but Conyers is appointing in essence his son to be his, or endorsing his son to be his successor, mm -hmm. and his son has been accused of domestic abuse uh, against his girlfriend. So I'm you know where does it end? Well, I think it ends when we take uh, the power away from the politicians. When you <laughs> when you um, Good luck with that, John. Will you emasculate them? And I don't, um, even female politicians, take take their power away from them so they have no quid to pro quo, and that's that's a, a horrible use of, a, of Latin. But uh, if you don't have power to give, you can't hold that power over somebody's head. And, and uh, if there are no checks and balances, you know, write some, write some ethical behavior standards. In, in the corporate world, you certainly have ethical behavior standards. You have in, in many companies, uh, you can't uh, date someone that reports to you. You can't, if you're, if you're a senior executive level at a company, you can't have a relationship with someone because, because the appearance of favoritism uh, will create um, um, bad morale in the organization. Uh, one, so, of the, one of the yeah. solutions to this whole thing is to have more political parties. It's a numbers game. Mm -hmm. Twenty, thirty percent of the population hard left. Twenty, thirty percent of the population hard right. Twenty, thirty percent of the population in the center, or I like to say libertarian. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have uh, a plurality vote, wins, uh, and the, that plurality vote is somebody who is common sense on uh, the exercise of power, is not power hungry, is not going to abuse power once elected, then. Uh, you know, if 30% can get an, a, liber a libertarian elected, then the Democrats and the Republicans are going to have to clean up their game. The problem, of course, is ballot access. And uh, a good nice example of that. There, Richard. <laughs> nice a good segue. example of that is, uh, is Georgia, where the Libertarian Party has had to go to federal district court to sue in order to get on the ballot in congressional elections in Georgia. Now, Statewide in Georgia, you only have to get like a petition to get, get, get you know, if you're going to petition to get on 10%? the ballot, you need about 1% statewide, 1%. 1 or 2%, something. It's doable. And libertarians who've gotten on the ballot have gotten up as, as much of a, as a third of the vote. Hmm. I mean, libertarians are popular in Georgia if they can get on the ballot. Hmm. But in congressional races, it requires 5%, not of the voters, not of the people who voted in the last election, but of the eligible voters in that, in, in that particular district. Which means, in the state of Georgia, if the Libertarian Party wants to feel the full slate of congressional candidates, they'd have to spend upwards of two and a half million dollars plus pay uh, fees to the state to get uh, to get their candidates on the ballot. So guess what? Ever since those laws started back in the 1940s, no third parties, no Libertarians, no Greens, no anybody, even even uh, Cynthia McKinney, who tried to run as a Green, as, when. She, after she'd already been an incumbent Democrat, she couldn't even get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. The point is, they have effectively 
ruled out getting anybody on the ballot other than Democrats and Republicans. A third party on the ballot will remedy a lot of these things. Richard, let me ask you this, because of course we all speak with reverence and respect for the Constitution, as we should, as, as one of the most amazing achievements, I think, in Western civilization. But anyone who's a fan of the Constitution or has read the Federalist Papers, I always say, take a look at the Anti-Federalist Papers, because it wasn't as cut and dry as a lot of seventh grade textbooks will have you believe when it comes to the founding of the country. And a lot of the issues identified by the anti-federalists that were opposing the adoption of the new, of the new constitution at that time in, in its form, a lot of their predictions have come to pass. And so when it comes to... Uh, Give me some examples. Well, and should, well talking about uh, the uh, expansive power uh, of the presidency, the executive branch, some of the clauses included in Article 2, the Necessary and Proper Clause, the Commerce Clause, a lot of these things were specifically um, left kind of open. These were open clauses with the idea being we're going to imbue the new government with flexibility for unforeseen because we cannot predict changing circumstances, therefore. Right. So when it comes to um, issues like this, there have been arguments um, in terms of comparative politics and government that if you were to change something like, because a lot of times, uh, you know, the two-party system that we're talking about uh, Which is not part of the Constitution. Can, can, be, can be attributed, though, to single member first past the post uh, representative districts mm -hmm. in, in Congress. And other countries have proportionality in multi member districts. If this district that we're talking about had a multi member district with the population breaking out the way that you're saying it does, we, we could very well have two or three. So you're talking about parla more of a parliamentary, parliamentary, par parliamentary yeah. system. Yeah. With the idea being that we have reverence for the Constitution, it, it's an amazing thing. But the Constitution is, is 200 years old, and it is not necessarily uh, gospel in terms of what is possible when it comes to issues like this. And I think that would be probably a perspective that someone opposing um, the Constitution, one of the issues we could talk about is the, the number of representatives or the number of population per district, or how many represent, how that would be apportioned, how representation would be apportioned. So it, it makes me wonder, if it came to a proposal for, like John said, a parliamentary system, that could imbue more libertarian representation in, in Congress. Would that be something that would be worth? Would be worth well, I, I think you take take a look at, at New Hampshire as a, as, a, as a case study. In New Hampshire, which is one of the smaller states population-wise, it has I think one of the largest uh, uh, state assemblies uh, in, in terms of the, the numbers of state assemblymen and state senators. So, the ratio of assemblymen or state senators to the population is very low. Uh, you probably know your state assemblyman by 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 first name. So you don't know six thousand you don't, per something. Something like California, that. It's, yeah, it's, it's very low. It's, it's like, hundreds of thousands. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. So that and and New Hampshire is one of the uh, states in the country which is fairly well run in terms of the uh, majoritarian impulse of Democrats to control Republicans and Republicans to control Democrats and. Uh, nanny state laws and you name it, not not so not so great in New Hampshire. And in fact, libertarians there's called there's something called the Free State Project. Libertarians are moving to New Hampshire because they know they have a fighting chance of actually winning elections there and and uh, keeping the government in check because the uh, well, representation is such that they have uh, a chance of actually being able to get elected and being able to well, here in uh, California, have some influence on yeah. the people that they do elect. Here in California, there there is a lawsuit against the Secretary of State, I think, and, and I apologize for not being able to remember the particulars of it, but for the very thing that you're talking about, that the way uh, we have so few representatives uh, in our assembly, in our state legislature, and they represent so many people that um, minority interests uh, Either not either Republican or, or Democrat aren't represented at all. Yeah. Yet, if those districts were, you know, uh, cut into ten pieces, then then that that um, libertarian chunk of Granite Bay, for example, um, could have a libertarian voice, or Tehama County, or you know, the agricultural counties that are basically being looted of water as it ships to Southern California. Uh, because they don't have enough representation to yeah. fight the battle. Yeah. So um, the idea that there there should be you know fewer people represented by somebody in the legislature is is gaining ground even in the state of California. Which is and all it very, makes a lot of sense. That's a good thing and, yeah. and ballot access.
yeah. uh, for everybody, uh, for all parties, is one way of getting yeah, and moving in that direction. Uh, on the national level, uh, uh, candidate Trump uh, made a, a lot of noise about uh, uh, Hillary's deals with uh, Saudi Arabia, the Clinton Foundation accepting contributions from, from Saudi Arabia. 20 million, I think. Should, should give yeah. them back. Per year. Uh, and, uh, you know, he made a lot of noise giving libertarians a misguided, in retrospect, hope that he might be fairly good on foreign policy. Mm. Now that he's president, his first foreign trip was to Saudi Arabia. Wait a second, are you saying that a politician said something and then did the opposite thing? Richard, you are, blow, you are blowing my mind right now. I'm Please. shocked by this. this there's happens. no gambling in this in, in this in, in this uh, in this, this establishment happens. either. You yes. mean a politician lied? Yeah. There uh, is no Santa Claus. <laughs> but it's particularly odious in this particular case mm. because Saudi Arabia essentially has had a palace coup. The King of Saudi. Uh, keep in mind, this is a medieval monarchy. Mm. That's the na that's their their form of government. The king had a crown prince. He deposed the crown prince and brought his son in as the new crown prince. The son immediately, essentially, imprisoned all of his rivals. They're being imprisoned in Saudi Arabia, so they're being imprisoned in the Ritz Carlton, mm. but nevertheless imprisoned, and their bank accounts have been looted. Mm. I mean, Saudi Arabia is running a little bit low on oil money right now. So this is a good way to get, you know, to fill the, the royal coffers, as it were. In the meantime, Saudi Arabia is fighting a vicious war against Yemen. Uh, why? I'm not sure, except that it's a proxy war. Mm -hmm. They're fighting a war against Yemen. Yemen, uh, one faction in Yemen is being supported by Iran. The other faction in Yemen is being supported by Saudi Arabia. So it's really a hegemonic war between Saudi Arabia and Yemen being fought. Shia and Sunni battle. Well, Shia yeah, and yeah. Sunni, and it's also Shia and Sunni, and it's also influence over the, the Middle East, whether it's Irani, uh, uh, Iranian influence or Saudi influence that kind of rules that part of the world. So you've got the United States <clears throat> providing 110 billion dollars worth of arms to one side of the of this essentially local, regional war, being cheer-led by Trump saying, hey, I'm providing defense jobs for American defense companies. Mm. Well, it, Saudi, I have a, I have a problem with, with uh, Saudi Arabia and I have a problem with Iran, both of them, a theocracy and basically a, a medieval monarchy. And we, we talked in an earlier segment about the, uh, you know, actually earlier in this segment, about um, politicians forcing themselves on people and all the rest of that. At least in, in this country, as, as, um, as painful as it is and as abused as it is, we still have laws that, that we have an age of consent. We have uh, laws governing, uh, you know, basically rape. Um, and the idea that, that uh, someone has to consent to a sexual activity and, and if they're forced, there's, there's, uh, um, there are consequences to pay. In Saudi Arabia, there is no age of consent because the idea of consent is not present in their legal system. And a few years ago, they tried to establish an age of consent in, in Saudi Arabia. For females? At, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, at 16, and the, the king said, no, we don't want that. So there, there are girls who are married to these basically pederasts, these child molesters. At, well, I guess they wouldn't be pederasts, but they were child molesters um, at ages 10 or 11, which to me is, is um, that's an executable offense in my mind. And so how we can support a government that not only says that that's morally not reprehensible, but has been uh, proved to uh, be the money behind some terrorist acts that have taken American lives. Um, I, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. And then the other side of the coin is the, the Iranian uh, mullahs basically created the, the, um, the war created the murder bombers that we see popularized in the 70s. I mean, there was uh, inner 
religion violence between the Sunni and the Shia, but the idea of, of you know, using children, strapping bombs to children and blowing up mosques and all this, that stuff, really came out of Iran. And so um, there, is no, there are no good guys in this fight. And, and Which leads us, to the conclusion that yeah, we shouldn't be supporting either we side. We shouldn't support either side. And, and, uh, they'll either and, side will sell us their oil, and yeah. eventually they'll kill them. So you know they'll, you know, who knows what'll happen? But it does. It's not our fight. It's not our fight. We don't have a dog. The, the only dog in the fight is the only dog in the fight is the petrodollar, yeah. which is another story entirely. Yeah, we could have a whole segment on that. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more topic, since we're talking about war and uh, and death, is the uh, the heightened threat of war on the Korean Peninsula with King Kim Jong-un. King Kim. Uh, launching Basically. missiles and blowing up ba uh, nukes mm -hmm. and, and, and President Trump uh, rattling his own war drums. Mm -hmm. Are we about to see a, two, you know, a, a war in the next uh, 12 months uh, in the Korean Peninsula? I hope not. Uh, I'm, I'm an ex-paratrooper and I would hate to see, because if it happens, there, there's going to be an awful lot of uh, young men and women, boys and girls uh, killed. But I'm, I'm going to offer a slightly different perspective on this. Um, there's a nuclear club out there, and, and the only people that are in it that, that are, you know, get our check mark of approval, that's us, France, China, Great Britain, Britain, um, Pakistan, uh, India. India, and Russia. T tacitly, uh, uh, Israel. Well, then Israel. Tacitly. Uh, Tacitly. So, if I were a little country like, I don't know, Yemen, Zimbabwe, whatever, and and the saber rattling U.S. had an ally right next door, and the U.S. has dropped the only two nuclear weapons ever dropped on uh, during the war in a population, I'd want to have a bomb too, quite frankly. And I think uh, um, I'm not saying North Korea is a, a good guy, but I understand their fear of of the U.S. and especially if you've watched the insane way we decide to do things politically, we are really, really bad at, at uh, going into a place and doing something and, and we seem to do it at whim. So if I was the leader of, of, of North Korea, I'd probably want to have a bomb too. I think John and I had spoken about this in a previous show, which is a certain level of um, international relations and legitimacy that comes to a nation state by possessing a nuclear weapon. The saber battling, I think, benefits. We're, we're running out of time, so we're just going to have to <laughs> hope. North Korea. We're going to have to hope that the saber rattlers on both sides don't rattle too much. That's the show. Don't we'll pull that saber out. Just rattle it, folks. We'll see you again next week, same time, same Keep place. Keep it in the, the sheet. On the Libertarian Counterpoint.